kind of feel obligated to tell you that Dr. Neil Copeland is the director of the Cancer Research Institute at the Houston Methodist Research Institute. We're going to learn about evolution and tumors. Here's Neil. I want to begin by thanking Larry for inviting me to this year's Gold Lab Symposium. It, uh, it's not the kind of meeting I normally go to, you know, it looks like a, very, a lot of very interesting talks in a very eclectic mix, and I, I'm looking forward to it. See, I'm, I'm suffering from a, a cold that I picked up in Singapore last week, so I hope my voice holds out, so we'll, we'll see. So, so what I'm going to do in my talk today is I'm going to first summarize what we've learned from recent large-scale efforts to characterize human cancer genomes. And I'm going to show you that this has really revolutionized our understanding of how cancer evolves. And then I'm going to outline some of the limitations of these efforts and then describe a transposon system that Nancy and I developed in our lab back in 2005 that, um, that, um, that makes it possible to study cancer in mice in a way you can't do it in humans and show you why we think this technology is, is useful um, with respect to human cancer. And then I'm going to show you how, using this transposon system, we're beginning to identify the evolutionary forces that um, drive tumor development. And this information, we hope, is going to have a positive impact on how we treat cancer. So this is a, a fairly diverse group of people. So I'm going to put in some slides that I wouldn't normally do. So please bear with me. So just for those of you who don't normally think about cancer, what is cancer and what causes it? So what we know now is that cancer is a genetic disease and it's caused by mutations in genes that's encoded in our DNA, which results in uncontrolled cell growth. We also know that cancer doesn't result from just one mutation in your cell, but it results from multiple mutations that cooperate to induce disease. And this is a really good thing. So if cancer were easy to get, and you got it from just one mutation or maybe two mutations in two cancer genes, we'd probably all be dead before we were old age. Now we used to think that cancer, you acquired these mutations in a linear fashion, shown here. So the idea was, during your, your probably adolescent life, you would pick up a mutation in say gene A, and that would give that cell some proliferative advantage, and that cell would start to outgrow your normal cells. And then sometime later, you would pick up another mutation in gene B, another cancer gene, and now you would have two mutations, and that cell would now outcompete the cells that just have one mutation. And so the idea is, is this process of acquiring new mutations, a mutation in C, and then D, and then E, goes on, and it takes a long time. <clears throat> and that's why cancer is a disease of old age, primarily. So what we've learned from this large-scale sequencing of human tumors is that cancer doesn't normally, I mean, sometimes it evolves this way, but not often. And it makes it much more complicated. And I'll talk a little bit that, about that later in my talk. We also know that cancer isn't just one disease. In fact, it's probably at least 100 disease that affect different organ systems. So people come up to me all the time and they say, well, how close are you to curing cancer? Well, Cancer isn't one disease, and each disease evolves differently through a different combination of mutations. So the answer is, well, the question is then, what cancer are you talking about? So it's really a horrendous problem, because we're not talking about one disease, but we're talking about Just lots of diseases. Now, with this uh, information in hand, many drug companies are now trying to develop drugs that target these mutant cancer genes to bring them back under control. And these are called targeted therapies. And there's I don't know, hundreds of targeted therapies that are being developed in pharmaceutical and biotech labs throughout the world. So there are actually two kinds of cancer genes that we need to think about. One class we call oncogenes. So oncogenes are genes that are like an accelerator on your car that gets stuck down, right? So these are genes that when you mutate them, increase their output and lead to uncontrolled cell growth. So the idea with drugs is to tamp them down. The other class of genes are called tumor suppressor genes. And these are genes are like the brake on your car. And basically, tumor suppressor gene mutations inactivate them. And so it's basically like, like you don't have any brakes anymore, and so you get uncontrolled cell growth. And so the idea is to fix that. 
Now, of course, if one's going to develop targeted therapies against oncogenes, and in some cases tumor suppressor genes, you need a complete list of all the genes. So that's really stimulated over the last, I'd say, five years or so, a worldwide effort to sequence a large number of human cancer genomes. And the idea was to try and identify most of the genes that cause cancer, as well as their signaling pathways. So the idea was, is that in this large-scale effort, we would sequence somewhere around 25,000 cancer genomes from about 50 of the most common cancers that affect us. And in fact, this is a multi-billion dollar effort that is just winding down now. And through this effort, I think we have a much better picture of how cancer evolves. And we now know it's a much more insidious and difficult to treat disease. And I'm going to try and show you why that is in the next few slides. <clears throat> so what have we learned about cancer from sequencing all of these cancer genomes? Well, the first thing we've learned is that there are many more cancer genes than we previously thought. So many years ago, if you ask a cancer biologist how many cancer genes there were going to be, they were, they were going to say a handful, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50. And what we now know that that's not true, we know that there's hundreds, if not thousands, of cancer genes. The other thing we've learned is that only a few of these cancer genes are highly mutated in cancer. So the idea was is that we would identify these 20 or 30 cancer genes, and then they would be mutated, highly mutated in cancer, and then we'd develop drugs against them, and then we'd, we'd be done. But it turns out that's not true. So very few genes are, in fact, mutated in even 20% or more cancers of any one type. The vast majority of cancer genes, however, are mutated at intermediate frequencies or very low frequencies. So we have a large number of cancer genes that are mutated in maybe less than 1% of all tumors of any one class. So it's very difficult to get drug companies to develop drugs against a gene that's only going to be mutated in 1% of your cancers. It's too expensive. The other thing is, we thought by sequencing 25,000 cancer genomes, we'd have a pretty good idea now what all the cancer genes are, and that turns out not to be true. And the reason is because so many cancer genes are infrequently mutated. And now they estimate that to identify, for example, in melanoma, all the cancer genes that are mutated at 1% frequencies or more, you may need to sequence at least five or 6,000 melanomas alone. And of course, this greatly complicates um, how we develop targeted therapies for treating cancer. Now, we've also learned <clears throat> that cancer doesn't evolve through a linear process. Sometimes it does, but not often. Rather, cancer evolves through what's called branching evolution, similar to our, uh, Darwin's iconic uh, evolutionary tree for, for um, species that walk the earth. So branching evolution works like this. So you have a, a cell, and that cell acquires a mutation in gene A, just like I showed you before, and then that cell divides. So you have two daughter cells. So you have this daughter cell and you have that daughter cell. And this daughter cell can pick up the mutation in gene B, but this daughter cell can pick up the mutation, a mutation in a different gene, say gene C. So now you have two cells with A and B and another cell with A and C. And then these daughter cells divide, and this daughter cell divides, and after they divide, they can pick up each different mutations. So you have A, B, and C, A, B, and D, and you get it. So through several cycles of this, over you know, maybe 60 years, 70 years of your life, cells are acquiring these mutations. And by the time a, a tumor develops, there's incredible uh, heterogeneity within the tumor, what mutations are required in each cell, and also between tumors from different people. So basically, we now know that everybody's tumor is unique. It's like your fingerprint. Right? And so that's why we all respond so differently to uh, therapies. So if you take 100 women with breast cancer and you treat them all with the same drug, you're likely to get many different uh, outputs. And that's because of this branching tumor evolution. It also explains why we so often develop resistance to drugs, right? We have some great targeted therapies. You know, it looks like they cure you, and within six months, your tumor comes back. And the reason we think that is is because you have this huge, complex tumor with maybe billions of cells. And in just a few cells in that tumor, you may already have a mutation in a gene that confers resistance to your drug. The vast majority of cells don't contain a resistant mutation, but some do. So what appears to happen is when you treat the patient with the drug, all the tumor cells 
die away, except for those few tumor cells that have a mutation already in a, in a resistant gene. And then over the period of months, or maybe even years, those cells grow back and they reform your tumor. So it's a really big problem. <clears throat> so we've also learned the importance of um, non-coding mutations in, in cancer. So for example, cancer genes can be regulated by what's called epigenetic me mechanisms, rather than direct mutations in the genes, the cancer genes themselves. So the way all the sequencing has worked is we sequence the genomes, but we just focus on the, the, the coding region. We, we ignore everything else. But we now know a lot of the mutations are, don't, aren't in the coding region. We also know that you can have cancer-causing mutations in the upstream transcriptional machinery, such as enhancers, transcription factors, co-activators, co-repressors. And these can also deregulate cancer genes. We also now know that you can have mutations in microRNAs and long non-coding RNAs, and they can also deregulate the expression of cancer genes. So it's a big mess. So the problem is, is that all the sequencing technology that we're using to characterize human tumors, they're getting us a lot, but they're not getting us everything. And so this is where we think our transposon system becomes so valuable, because our transposon system can identify genes that are that are, uh, represent uh, these genes that are, that are mutated uh, epigenetically or uh, at the transcriptional machinery level. So we think we can, we can see a lot of the mutations in our mouse screens that, is, that are missing in the human uh, screens. So the transposon system that we use in the lab is called Sleeping Beauty. And the, it's, um, it came from salmon, so it's a fish system and it's been adapted for use in mammalian cells. And the way we use it in the lab, it's a two-part system composed of the transposon DNA, shown here. And this is a mobile piece of DNA. You can put it in the mouse genome, and then you can express the, the transposase in trans, and it binds to the end of the transposase, makes double-strand breaks, cuts it out of the genome, and then pastes it in someplace else. So this is a, a mobile piece of DNA that can integrate all over the genome. The only requirement for integration is a TA dinucleotide, which then gets duplicated and flanks the end of the inserted element. So the idea is we put the transposon in the mouse genome, and then we mobilize it, and we cause it to start inserting all over the genome. And most of the time when it reinserts, it doesn't do anything, but sometimes it can create a cancer-causing mutation. And if you get enough insertions that cause cancer-causing mutations that cooperate, eventually you'll get a tumor. And then we just go in and we sequence the transposon insertion sites in these tumors, and, and they're flanking DNA, and we look for the cancer genes. The cancer genes are tagged by the presence of the transposon. So the transposon we use in the lab has a very strong promoter misplaced donor site. So if this transposon lands upstream of an oncogene in the same orientation, it can splice in and upregulate that oncogene. It can deregulate it. It also contains splice acceptor sites and, po and a bidirectional poly A. So it can act as a gene trap. So if it lands in a coding region of a tumor suppressor gene in either orientation, it can inactivate it. So it's a bifunctional transposon that can turn on oncogenes or inactivate tumor suppressor genes. Now, the way we use the system in the lab is shown here. So since we're going to have to create lots of mutations over time in lots of different genes to get a tumor, we decided to make mice, transgenic mice, that had 350 copies of this mutagenic transposon all linked together at a single site in the genome. So I'm only showing some of the copies here, but 350, every cell in the animal. Okay, so now what we do is if we, model, model, if we want to model cancer in some organ, let's say liver, we express the transposase specifically in the liver, and it mobilizes, starts cutting these transposons out one by one from this concatenar only in the liver, and pastes them back in randomly all over the genome. And this process continues for months, if not years, until we in, in, acquire enough mutations to cause cancer. And then we just go in and we sequence all the insertion sites. We PCR amplify them first, sequence them, and then look for the genes. And now it's just a bioinformatics nightmare, basically. <laughs> so during the last 10 years since we've developed the system, and a lot of this, I would say, was done when we moved to Singapore, where we had unlimited amounts of money, we modeled 16 different cancers that affected 10 different organ sites. And in the rest of my talk today, I'm going to describe three short stories. Um, one, a colorectal cancer model we developed, one, a liver cancer model, and one, a melanoma model. And I'm using these stories just to illustrate some of the fundamental principles that we can learn
from this transposon mutagenesis. Okay, so you all know colon cancer is an important contributor to cancer uh, mortality and morbidity. Each year, more than 1.2 million new cases of colorectal cancer are diagnosed, and more than 600,000 people are, are killed. Over the years, scientists have identified several critical genes and processes important to the initiation and progression of colorectal cancer. However, in spite of this, knowledge regarding the genes and processes uh, needed to acquire colorectal cancer are still uh, very limited. So, like most epithelial cancers, and colon ca uh, colorectal cancer is one of them, so that means it's derived from epithelial cells, it goes through several well-defined stages, and there are a number of key mutations in cancer genes that have been identified in each step. So in uh, colorectal cancer, the first gene that gets mutated is one of these tumor suppressor genes, and it's called APC. And this happens in about 80% of people who have colorectal cancer. And this occurs at the transition from normal epithelia to what's called early adenoma. Then, later on, you acquire an activating mutation in an oncogene called KRAS at the transition from early adenoma to intermediate adenoma. Then you have a loss of function mutation in a tumor suppressor gene, SNAD4, and then a loss of function mutation in a tumor suppressor gene called P53. Now, in thinking about how to model uh, colorectal cancer in our mice using transposons, we decided that we would mobilize, specifically, of course, the transposon in the GI tract, because we wanted to model colorectal cancer. And we decided to do that in just normal mice, wild-type mice. But we also did something else, because we had unlimited money. So what we decided to do was mobilize the transposon in the GI tract of mice <clears throat> that already carried a mutation in APC that we created through genetic engineering. So what we were looking for was the transposon to insert and mutate genes that cooperated with the mutation in APC that already existed in these cells. We also made mice that had an activating mutation in KRAS and did the same thing. We mobilized the transposon in those cells. And also mice that had SMAD4 mutation and also mice that had P53 mutation. So we had five different cohorts of mice, all of which had the transposon, but either a wild type or carried one of these mutations. So in, in experiments that were published um, early this year, actually, um, what we found is that all, different, all five cohorts of mice developed, liver, or developed colorectal cancer, and that's exactly what we'd hoped. But the, but the time that they died, the order in which they died, was very striking. So what we found was that the mice that died first were the mice that already carried a mutation in APC, plus, of course, the transposon. The next mice to die were mice that carried a mutation in KRAS. The next mice to die were ones that carried SMAD4 mutation. The next mice to die were mice that carried the P53 mutation. And the last mice to die didn't carry any mutations. They were the wild type mice. We never expected that. But what that says is, is that the mutations that act early in tumor progression are more oncogenic in this model than those that act later. And we don't know why. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> so now we <clears throat> wanted to clone and sequence the transposon insertion sites from all five different cohorts of mice and identify the candidate cancer genes. Now, these are candidate genes because we haven't validated them. It's all done by statistical arguments. So from this five different cohorts, <clears throat> we selected 1,112 tumors, and we sequenced the transposon insertion sites, and we identified 1,333 candidate cancer genes. So why did we identify so many candidate cancer genes from so few tumors? We, well, one of the reasons is because these are huge, highly mutagenized tumors. Remember, we have 350 copies of the transposon being mobilized all over the cell for a long period of time. So, and we can see these insertions. The other thing is, is that we can see the insertions in cancer genes that happen very late during tumor evolution at the, at the tips of the cancer evolutionary tree. So if you sequence a human tumor, you can only identify mutations in cancer genes that are present in about 1% or more of all cells in the tumor. But in a transposon-induced tumor, we can see insertions in cancer genes that are present in a very small fraction of cells in the tumor. So by sequencing just one transposon-induced tumor, we get a picture of tumor evolution that's much more complete than what you would get 
by sequencing a human tumor. So we had these genes. So how many of these genes function early in tumor evolution versus late? And it turns out, in all the models, we think the vast minority function early in tumor, uh, tumor uh, genesis at the initiation or early progression stages. And in fact, out of these genes, we estimate that about 10% are functioning early in tumor development, while the rest, these genes here, are functioning late in tumor progression. And we tend to think of these as tumor modifiers. <clears throat> So how, <clears throat> how relevant are the mouse data for human colorectal cancer? Well, if you look at the genes, what we find is that known human colorectal cancer genes are significantly enriched among the candidate cancer genes that we identified in our mouse model. So it seems like it's going to be highly relevant. We also identified several new human colorectal cancer genes in our mouse studies, and we validated one new gene in this paper that we published. Our mouse data also identified several well-known uh, cam colorectal cancer signaling pathways and identified a number of new signaling pathways not previously associated with human, the human disease. Now, I think the most important discovery that came out of this model is that the order in which the cancer-causing mutations are acquired matters. So the mutation that occurred first, which is usually APC, affects the nature of the mutations that occur second and so on down the line. And this kind of makes sense because it has to cooperate with the mutation that occurs first. And there's only so many genes that can cooperate. Okay, now I'm going to, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you uh, one example from, of this and how we think that it might impact how you treat human CRC. <clears throat> so as I've shown you, the APC tumor suppressor gene is the initiating mutation in at least 80% of human colorectal cancer. And it's a tumor suppressor gene. And what APC does is it regulates what's called the signaling pathway. This is a cancer signaling pathway. It's also important in normal development. When you lose APC, you turn on WIMP signaling. Okay, remember, it's like a break. <clears throat> now, what we found, however, in our mice that had a SMAD4 mutation, these mice that we created, what you normally saw was mutations in another gene in the Wnt signaling pathway. <clears throat> and that gene was usually one of two R-spondin genes. So you activated, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, you activated the Wnt pathway in a different way. So what we found is in our mouse tumors that already had a mutation in SMAD4, that the transposon insertions tend to be located upstream of this oncogene in the same transcriptional orientation where they activated expression of this gene. Now it turns out that r spondins are secreted proteins, and they bind to cell surface L receptors called LGR. And these are facultative Wnt receptors, so they turn on the Wnt signaling pathway at the level of the receptor. So in a wild-type cell, there's a very strong selection to activate Wnt downstream in the pathway, in the, in the cytoplasm. Whereas if you already have a mutation in APC, you tend to mutate the pathway at the level of the receptor. Now, it's very interesting <clears throat> that r spondin mutations, which activate r spondin, have recently been identified in about 10% of cases of human CRC, and that was published a couple of years ago. Now, it's very interesting. I just talked to the guys at Genentech who actually published this paper, and they went back and looked at the data after they saw our data. And similar to the mouse, these variant tumors also tend to contain mutations in SMAD4 and lack mutations in APC. So they're doing the same thing. So this says that maybe combinatorial therapies that uh, in these variant forms of CRC that target TGF-beta signaling, TGF-beta is the pathway that gets activated when you mutate SMAD4, and R-spondin, uh, and there are, there are drugs already being developed for R-spondin, might be useful in treatment of this 10% of variant CRC uh, that have r spondin mutations. OK, next I'm going to tell you about another mouse model that we just published this month that was generated by transposon mutagenesis of mouse melanocytes that already that we engineered to carry a, 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 a mutation in a, another oncogene. It was a B600E activating mutation in the BRAF oncogene. Now, the reason we did that is because in human cutaneous melanoma, 
40 to 60 percent of all melanomas carry this mutation in this BRAF gene. So in melanoma, the BRAF mutation is just like the mutation in APC in human CRC. So we started out with a melanocyte that already had the initiating mutation. Then we mobilized the transposon specifically in these melanocytes, and we asked for the mutations that cooperated. So what we found after a, a few weeks, we actually found hundreds of pigmented nevi on the skin of these mice. And then if you wait about 36 weeks, on average, 80% of the mice will have developed cutaneous melanomas, and they usually develop between one and four cutaneous melanomas. Interestingly, if you don't have the BRAF B600 mutation and you just mobilize the transposon, you don't get tumors. So what this says is in, in mice that have this mutation as well as the transposon, that that's sufficient to drive the induction of melanomas. So next we cloned and we sequenced this, the transposon insertion sites from 77 of these melanomas. And in this case, we identified 1,232 candidate cancer genes. And just like I showed you before, the, the vast majority are involved in progression. In this case, we estimate that only 21 or so of these genes are important in initiation. So additional analysis of these melanoma, in fact, we did a lot of analysis. I'm just going to tell you a, a, a couple of things. Um, an, um, additional analysis showed that, uh, that uh, in fact, out of these 1,000 whatever genes there were, 148 were actually transcription factors. And as you can see, the p-value for that was very significant. So transcription factors are proteins that regulate the expression of other proteins. That was very interesting. And inter also interestingly, 15 of these 148 transcription factors were predicted to bind to 91% of our melanoma candidate cancer genes and, and, and thereby regulate them. So this result suggests that these mouse melanoma candidate cancer genes function in large signaling pathways that can be deregulated at multiple levels, including at the transcriptional level. So we decided to look at that a little more. So to better understand these interaction networks, we search, we search for functional links between these 1,000 whatever melanoma candidate cancer genes. And so using a database now of human molecular interactions, we identified 352 mouse melanoma candidate cancer genes, which had at least one biological connection to another melanoma can candidate cancer gene. And the total connectivity between all these genes was 1,281. And that is highly significant, as you can see over here. So, this is likely the reason we have so many candidate cancer genes. And this, I should say, is consistent with a lot of data from other labs and what's being found in humans. So we have a large number of cancer genes, but they appear to act in only a limited number of signaling pathways, like the WIT signaling pathway or the TGF beta signaling pathway. But in each pathway, you can have large numbers of genes. It's like a circuit, and you have lots, lots of transistors. And you can deregulate that pathway by mutating many different genes. So lots of genes, but the output of the pathway is you know, the same. So this is suggested to a lot of people, including people like Vogelstein, who actually suggested this in a science paper a while ago, that it, you might be better off targeting the, um, the signaling pathways themselves rather than the individually mutated genes, because a lot of these are very rarely mutated. Yes. Now, further analysis showed that 15 of our melanoma candidate cancer genes uh, such as Rho A and RAC1, shown here in red, are actually very highly connected to other melanoma candidate cancer genes. And the p-value for these is like 30 to minus 30 to minus 35. So these are highly connected. So if you're, if you're thinking about how to target a pathway, where do you target it? What gene do you target, right? And that's not a trivial problem. So one place to target would be the nodes the proteins that are most highly connected to other proteins in the network. So we think that these genes like Rho A and RAC1 might be good targets to deregulate the pathway because they're the most highly connected. Okay, we also sought to address the clinical significance of our uh, mouse melanoma candidate cancer genes for, uh, for melanoma patient survival. This is human patient survival. So using publicly available gene expression data for human melanoma, that also reported patient survival data, we actually identified 46 of our mouse melanoma candidate cancer genes whose expression levels in human melanomas 
have clinical significance for, patient, for predicting patient survival. So I'm just showing you three genes here. So these are three of, uh, of, our, of these 46 genes. And you can see that for these three, if you, if you uh, are low expression for this gene, you don't survive as long than if you express our higher levels of these genes. And interestingly, 12 of these genes um, are among these genes that are highly connected to other, other genes that we identified. OK, so in the last few slides of my talk, I'm going to talk uh, uh, about our transposon-induced model for liver cancer, which was published early last year. And I'm going to show you how this model has helped to elucidate some of the major evolutionary forces that drive development of hepatocellular carcinoma in humans. Hepatocellular carcinoma is liver cancer, for those of you who might not know. So we, of course, we mobilized the transposon, specifically in the liver of mice. And what we found is, uh, with a very long latency on the order of 65 weeks, that we were able to identify, we were able to induce multiple different uh, tumors per liver. And as far as we can tell from cloning insertion sites, they're all independent. We also observed three times more tumors in the males than the females, and the tumors occurred earlier in the males than the females. And this is exactly what happens in human. The same gender disparity occurs in human liver cancer. Now, the time course of the disease in our mouse models is, again, identical to what you see in humans. So what we first see is chronic liver inflammation that then proceeds to the formation of premioplastic foci that then turn into hepatocellular adenoma, which are early stage cancer, and then invasive cancer, which is called hepatocellular carcinoma. <clears throat> So next, we sequenced uh, the transposon insertions from 260 or 250 tumors. And what we identified was 2,881 candidate cancer genes. So we thought, you know, are we, are we going to hit every gene in the genome? Well, it turns out when we looked that this is essentially a saturating screen. So we know that because if we keep sequencing more tumors, we don't identify many more genes. So it does reach saturation, and it reached saturation in this screen at about 100 tumors. So to our knowledge, this is the first screen that's ever been published that's reached near saturation. <clears throat> and there are a lot of genes. But a lot of them are tumor modifiers, right? So again, only 21 of these genes are predicted to function early in tumor development to be major drivers. And in fact, seven of these are already known to be involved in human initiators in human uh, liver cancer where the vast majority turn out to be involved in tumor progression. Again, we think of these as tumor modifiers. And then we just, you know, we, we look to see what pathways that these genes may be functioning in. And just like we find in all the models, they're functioning in well-known cancer signaling pathways, like WINT, P53, AKT, RAS, ERK, HIPPO, and TGF beta. So that all makes sense. And then we look to see, um, among these 2,800 and whatever cancer genes, what cellular processes that they may be functioning in. And this is where we got a really big surprise. So when we did that, what we found is, is that 1,119 of these genes are functioning in cellular metabolic processes. So like 40 some percent, 42% uh, of these genes are functioning in metabolic processes. And the p-value for that is minus 60. So clearly, this did not happen by accident. So what kind of metabolic processes are being affected by the transposon in these tumors? So we, we looked at that more. And what we found is, is that these cancer genes were enriched in 47 different metabolic categories, including genes associated with protein, carbohydrate, lipid, nucleic acid, and metabolism. So this highlights the potential importance of metabolic genes in hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, we think this data could help explain why hepatocellular carcinoma is the fastest rising can, uh, cause of cancer-related death in the US. And in fact, in Texas, it, uh, it's, um, it is the fastest rising cancer. And it's a big problem in Texas. So during the past two decades, shown here, the incidence uh, of hepatocellular carcinoma in the U.S. has actually tripled. Now, while the, while the five-year survival rate has gone up, it's still less than 12%. So it's a huge problem. 
And the biggest proportional increases in hepatocellular carcinoma are found in Hispanics and white people in the United States between 45 and 60 years of age. Now, we know that a large part of that increase is due to an increased rate of infection of, of people for, with hepatitis Z virus, C virus. So this is a big cause uh, of this rise, but it's not the only cause. And so clearly there are other causes as well. And clearly one other cause is obesity. So in this paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and you can't see it because it's down off the bottom, in um, 2003, by call it all, what they showed is, is that people who have body mass indexes of greater than 35, and that means severely obese people, that their uh, incidence of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is increased 4.52 times. So we've known for a long time that obesity is linked to increases in cancer of all kinds. So if you just look here, you can see that prostate cancer is increased by 1.34 times, whereas pancreatic cancer is in, in increased 2.61 times. But it's increased the most for liver cancer. So in a follow-up paper published in 2012, Schlesinger et al. showed that it wasn't just overall obesity that was associated with increased risk of, of, of hepatocellular carcinoma, but it was increases in uh, abdominal fat. And we all know we see these people all the time, right? And increases in abdom uh, abdominal fat or visceral fat is associated with a condition called metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome has a lot of things that define it. And visceral fat is just one of them. Other things are high blood pressure, high serum triglyceride levels, low HDL levels, increased insulin resistance, and increased levels of diabetes, fatty liver, and HCC. <clears throat> so metabolic syndrome is, is um, very interesting. It's thought to be um, um, associated with um, problems in energy utilization and storage, right? So while it's not exactly clear why this leads to increases in HCC, I think our, our model could help explain that because of this effect of all these metabolic genes and HCC. We think that HCC is in part a metabolic disease. <clears throat> and so maybe it's all these things that go on in these people that are somehow contributing to, to, to resetting the metabolic process inside the liver cell that helps contribute to disease. So if that's true, then maybe drugs that target some of these metabolic processes might be useful for treating HCC. And that's just a speculation. <clears throat> so in the last slide, I'll just kind of summarize what we've what I've tried to tell you today, and that's that transposons, we think transposon screens in mice can augment what we're learning from large-scale uh, sequence analysis of human cancer. And I tried to show you, you know, in the mouse, we can use genetic engineering to, to engineer in mutations, and then we can mobilize the transposon. And I showed you lots of examples of that. And that, in part, allowed us in the colorectal cancer screen to show the, um, the important contribution uh, of the, the order which mutations are occurring. They don't just occur totally randomly. The mutations that occur first affects the nature. It limits the, the nature of the mutation that occurs second, and, and so on down the line. I also showed you that transposon mutagenesis makes it possible to study the evolution of cancer on a scale that's not possible to do in human cancer right now with the current technology. We were actually able to do a near saturation screen for liver cancer in our mouse model. You can't, you can't do that. So by, by, since we can identify mutations that occur in cancer genes at the very tips of the cancer evolutionary tree, we get a lot of information regarding tumor evolution. So just the last slide, the acknowledgement slide, of course. Nancy and I have run the lab together for 35 years, and we're still talking. That's pretty amazing, and we even share an office. <laughs> and so just the people who did the work, uh, Haruna Takeda was a postdoc of ours in Singapore who did the CRC screen. And um, some of the validation studies were done by Zubo Wei in our lab in Houston. Um, Emily Bard did the HCC screen in our, in our lab in Singapore. She now works for Narvatis, uh, and, uh, and Haruna has her own lab back in Japan. And Michael Mann, he did the uh, melanoma screen that I talked about that was just published, actually. And he's in, still in our lab in, in Houston. So I'll stop there, and, and thank you for your attention.
We have a few minutes for questions. I'm looking forward this weekend to taking my kids to uh, Disney's new movie, The Sleeping Beauty Transpose On. I heard it's awesome. <laughs> yes, sir. Thanks, Neil. That was that was great. Um, uh, does do you see any? Is there any correlation in in any of the subset of the pro progressive genes, the progression genes, with uh, metastasis? Or are you able to pick that up? Or is that an entirely different process? So the problem with most of our mouse models is they don't metastasize, and that's true with most of the mouse models. So in the CRC screen, I didn't have time to mention it, but it's in the paper. So we had a lot of early stage adenomas in our our model, and we also had a lot of um, adenocarcinomas, more advanced stage invasive tumors. We didn't have very many metastases. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. We couldn't, <coughs> we couldn't look for metastasis genes. <coughs> but we were able to go back and, and take just the adenomas and, and look for the insertions, what genes were mutated there, as well as the adenocarcinomas. And we were able to identify a subset of genes that were more, much more highly mutated in adenocarcinomas rather than adenomas. And we were able to validate some of those and show their contribution to, to human tumors. So what we're doing now is where we do have metastasis, um, like a, 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 a prostate cancer model we have, we, we've gone into the metastasis and we've done laser capture micro dissection to, to clone those out. And we're just in the process to take, to take those cells and we're in the process now of sequencing these. So we think it's a great model if you have a metastasis to, to identify potential metastasis genes because you can use laser capture. And then you could look at insertions in genes that are specific to the metastasis and not the earlier stage tumor, which we can get from the same animal. Yeah. Yes, this lady right here. Beautiful work, Neil, as always. Uh, now there is quite a thrust in using <coughs> immunotherapy, particularly in melanoma, and extremely exciting results are coming out with that. Uh, what you have learned in this process with the melanoma does that give us more information and new ways and new targets for immunological intervention? It could. But, you know, we have to go back and validate these genes in human melanoma. So right now, they're just candidate genes. But it, it, it does say, it, it, I mean, I think everything that I've tried to show today is, says just how horrendous, you know, melanoma is one of the best ones for targeting with the immune therapies. And it's because it's so genetically diverse because they're induced by UV irradiation and you get lots of mutations. And so there's lots of epitopes that are expressed on the cell. But you know, every melanoma is gonna be different from other, every other melanoma, and the immune therapies don't work on everybody because everybody's different. Yeah, but, but, but what you said, we should go down to the trunk. Yes. Go to the core. Yes. And that's what you have yes. yes, yes, yes. But we're not at this stage yet where we validated those genes that you know. Uh, Neil, enjoyed your presentation. Can you comment on your ability to use the saturating transposon mutagenesis after tumor development occurs, apply pharmacotherapy, and look for the resistance pathway activation, which can facilitate that's a great combination to that's, that's where a lot of our lab is headed right now. Yeah, so the idea is, so once we start mobilizing the transposons, they continue, we, we can't shut them off with the technology we have right now. So the idea would be, so for instance, for the melanoma, we have very good drugs that target B, uh, BRAP B600E. And so the idea is that you let them develop the melanoma, you take some of the primary tumor, then you treat the animals with the drug, the tumors shrink, and then they come back. And we would argue when they come back, one of the reasons they're gonna come back is because the transposons inserted in drug-resistant gene. And then what we, we do is we take the tumors that come back, sequence the insertions and compare them to the tumor before we treat the drug. And we think that has a lot of potential in a lot of these models. In a different route, probably bioinformatically, can you see any opportunity to look at uh, synthetic lethal integration events, essentially defining where the transposons can't go, but the networks predict they might? Yeah, so we have so many genes, so this, it's difficult to get st statistically significant numbers. But we've looked for interactions. So we've looked for genes that cooperate. So you more often find them together in the same tumor. And we've looked for genes that would be excluded, that might, might represent synthetic lethality. Or it could just mean they're in the same pathway. Yeah. So we do find a number of genes that are predicted to cooperate. 
but we find very few things that are, are predicted to be excluded. And uh, that could be in part just because of the statistical problems. We have time for one. I, one I have a question. question. Where is I, it? I have a question. I hear yeah. it, but I don't see it. It's not yes. a scientific question. The success of cancer, thank, thank you for the terrific conversation. The, the one part of your slide where you said there's more than 100 kinds of cancers, from my perspective and what I do, the success of cancer and raising awareness and money for research and for therapy is that we've convinced the public it's one cancer so that it becomes a simple campaign. Um, you think that's why? You don't think that's right? No. No, because you have a lot of advocacy groups out there for different kinds of cancer, right? Sure. So you have the breast cancer guy, then you have, you know. So I, I, don't, I don't see why limiting to say there's one cancer is gonna allow you to raise more money. I would think you'd do better saying it's 100 different kinds of cancers and go, and go out there and try and get money from 100 different groups. I mean, there's no, there's, no, there's no arguing that cancer has been really successful in raising money. My question is more um, a question of the simplicity of the message when the science is complicated. We, we can agree to disagree on this, but that's my perspective. Larry, are there any social events where people can agree and disagree together planned for the weekend? <laughs> okay, here are.